Okay, um, welcome back everyone. So next talk is by Shadi Tavildazadeh from the University of Rutgers. And he will tell us about singularity theories of matter, weak second Bianchi identities and uh, brace mass of zero area singularities, I believe. <laughs> Observing a moment of silence in memory of uh, Mahsa and Nika and all the other young people of Iran that have lost their lives in the current protests, anti-government protests in Iran, I invite you to join me in condemning their killing and calling on the Iranian government to stop this uh, violent suppression of people and recognize uh, people's legitimate uh, rights and women's uh, rights to their own bodies and the choice of what they wear. I would like to thank uh, my collaborators. I'm very fortunate to uh, at Rutgers to be working with a large group of uh, very diverse, uh, uh, talented people. Uh, I will, uh, today, I will focus on joint work that I have done with my colleague, Michael Kisling and uh, Anne Gret, who's here. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but uh, many of the other people here are involved in uh, working on different aspects of this project. So I'm going to start, uh, this is an outline of my talk. I will talk about uh, Goldilocks singularities. I will define what I mean by that. And I will review for you the classical laws of motion of particles. So today I will only be talking about classical physics, although we do work on the quantum uh, uh, aspects of uh, problems as well. I will introduce this notion of weak Bianchi identity, which we find useful in, um, uh, in, in, in this project. I will recall for you Bray's definition of mass for the zero area singularities of uh, Riemannian manifolds and how it applies to the problem at hand. I will state uh, theorems and give you an outline of the proof. And uh, then I will conclude by giving you some applications of how these uh, results are used in, in physics. So let me start uh, very simple. This is a theorem that you've all seen in your first undergraduate PDE course, and you probably forgot it right away. And uh, if you have a second order hyperbolic operator and uh, Hyperbolic means this is the definition of hyperbolic for, for my purpose, that a symbol has signature minus plus, plus, plus. And, uh, and if you have a hypersurface uh, that's uh, given by the zero set of some function, some regular function, and if you have a domain and this hypersurface is gonna cut this domain into two parts, and suppose you have a solution to that hyperbolic uh, equation, which, um, has the property, so this is my domain, and this is your hypersurface S, and it's cutting the domain into two parts, and suppose that what you know about your solution is that it's C2 here, and it's C2 here, up to the boundary, and it's C1 overall. So the only thing that can happen is that the second derivatives can jump across this surface. Then there was a very nice theorem that you have seen that if the second, if the function is not C2 overall, this hypersurface has to be characteristic. Uh, so, um, so the way I would like to, and this is an example, if you take your operator to be the wave operator, then any null hypersurface will have that property. So the way I would like you to think about this is if you had, uh, 
if, uh, if one has a singularity, right, somewhere, and uh, if the singularity is of a certain class called weak class, which is, this is the definition of weak for me, so that a function is, say, C2 across a hypersurface and C1 overall, then this singularity is, is doomed to stay on the characteristic surface. It can't do whatever it wants. It, it's, its motion is confined right, to, to this particular surface. Uh, this is not true if the singularities are stronger than that. So I will give you some simple examples of that. And uh, the question is to understand what is the boundary between uh, singularity doing whatever it wants and it being confined to live on a characteristic. So those class of singularities are for me the interesting ones. So here's that simple example. They're all about the same equation, linear wave equation, right? And uh, you have this particular uh, two pieces of initial data, Cauchy data. And this, this one you can solve very easily. And you can see that the solution is singular along a null line. So in all of these cases, you have, a, you have some data that already has a singularity, right? As you can see, the data is singular. And when you solve that, in this first example, that's the, that is the trajectory of the singularity. So it, it is null, as you can see. Now, the other extreme, if you take the data to be much more singular than that, right, with the same example, then it turns out that basically you can do whatever you want here, and uh, and this will be uh, a, this will be a valid solution to be just one on one side and negative one on the other side of this thing, because the singularity is now too strong. Right, so the first example is a weak, the second one is a strong singularity. And now here's the in between situation, which we would like to study. So, is there such a thing as a singularity that's just right? What that would mean, it is not forced to lie on a characteristic. Well, it's all of these cases, you're solving it away from where it's singular. Right, right. So, of course, uh, you are completely right. Uh, these examples are a bit silly because the equations that I'm studying are linear, right? But, uh, but I would like to be applied to these two nonlinear equations. So, that's uh, where a notion of weak is not clear well, what it is, right? So, here, of course, uh, it's, it's very well understood, but this is just to give you a flavor of what we are looking for. Uh, is it possible uh, to find singularities such that their motion is not forced to lie on a characteristic, but however, can be determined? So you can find an equation of motion for the singularity, right? So these I will call Goldilocks. Uh, so, uh, and here's the, now here's a, a more serious example. So, Let's take a Klein-Gordon equation. Let's put a delta function on the right-hand side. So now I'm using the fact that we understand what that means, right? Because to, to put a delta source on the right-hand side of a linear equation, we understand that, right? And we look at that particular data that I have chosen, right? Uh, you notice that this part here is the, is the static solution of uh, of this equation, right? And then what I'm doing is I'm perturbing the static solution by something smooth. Okay? So and uh, you can ask the question, uh, what is what is the solution to this to this problem? And because this is simple enough, you can actually solve it, you would think. Right? However, here this is particularly interesting because this singularity is not forced to stay null. And yet you can get an equation of motion for the singularity. 
So I'm thinking of the, the trajectory of the singularity, this Q of T is another unknown in this problem. And I would like to write down equations for Q of T as well. And then look at this joint evolution problem between the field and the singularity of the field. So this is the objective. Right. So these equations are, are not hard to write down in general, right? We, we know from particle mechanics, okay, this is relativistic. So we have to do the relativistic version of that, right? So you have the usual equations, Q dot equals velocity. I have used the, have used the uh, relativistic relationship between velocity and momentum, right? And then the second equation says the derivative of the momentum is the force on the particle. And so long as I can find out what this force is, right, this would presumably, this force would somehow depend on the field U, right? That, and if I can find out this force, then I have a complete system with the unknowns in which would be the U, the field, and the Q, the, the trajectory of the singularity. So then I can study this joint evolution of field and particle, where by particle, I mean the singularity of the field. This is what I mean, right? So uh, this is, of course, would be the classical law of motion. This choice of this force F is called the law of motion. And this is the uh, classical version of the problem. This problem also has a quantum version that I will not say much about today as a subject of another talk, just suffice it to say that you can also formulate a quantum law of motion for this singularity. And that would be, instead of a second order, it's just going to be a first order uh, equation where the velocity field is given by solution of some quantum equation, for example, Dirac's equation with a certain Hamiltonian. So that's, that's it. And then the, there is a formula for the guiding how the velocity field is determined by the wave function. Okay, so, uh, but today I will focus on the classical uh, picture and I would like to uh, see, answer the question, where would the expression for this force come from? And if you are familiar with the, the procedure in physics, right? What you do is typically you write down an action functional for the whole thing, right? And then you take variations and so on. And then the Euler-Lagrange equations are supposed to give you everything. And interestingly, if you follow this approach, it's not going to work for, for this equation. And the reason it will not work is that you will obtain an equation for the force, but the force will be undefined exactly where you need it. Because the field is singular there. Uh, the, the, the expression that you get for the force will depend on the derivatives of the field. And because the field is singular exactly where the particle is, right, then this expression for the force doesn't make sense. So you cannot use that to solve this. And what we would like to do is how to get around this. One needs some other principle. The one that you usually use in physics does not seem to work. So one has to appeal to something else, right? Well, what is this something else? So first of all, before we get there, this is not a new idea. This is a very old idea. This was Einstein's original idea and other people such as Weil, the same Weil, they heard about that, uh, that what matter is nothing but singularities of a space time. So this was the idea of Einstein. Uh, one of the ideas that he later on rejected. But, uh, but for a while, he subscribed to that. He took that very seriously. And together with Infeld and Hoffman, they started this project where they would say, okay, if matter is actually singularities of a space-time, and 
Mr. Einstein has an equation for the metric of the space time. So maybe the equation of motion for the particles will come out of the field equations themselves. We can just start with Einstein's equations and massage them and somehow get the field equation out of them. So this is called the Einstein infield Hoffman approach, right? They wrote several papers, other people continue with that. Suffices to say, this doesn't satisfy the standards of rigor of that, that we have today about mathematics. There are, there are various problems with it and various quantities that at certain places in the paper I assumed are assumed very small and at certain other places in the paper, the same quantities are not assumed to be small. So, that's, uh, so there, are, there are issues with that. But, but certainly it's an intriguing thought that, uh, what, that whether this can be, how far one can push such an approach, right? Because if you can answer this problem uh, correctly, uh, satisfactorily, then you never have to say where does matter come from, right? Basically, everything is nothing. Everything is made up of nothing. So what we, what we view as matter is just singularity of space-time. That's, uh, so uh, there's a new approach that started by my colleague, Michael Kiesling, and then I joined later on. Uh, and that's to derive uh, this from the principle of conservation of energy generalized principle of conservation of energy. So, uh, so suppose that the field equation, so now here just the field equations, forget about the singularity. If the field equations are derivable from an action principle, then it is well known that there is an energy momentum tensor and that this energy momentum tensor satisfies this equation that is divergence free. Of course, all of this is true away from singularities in order to push this calculation through in a classical way. So imagine you are in a situation where the singularities are just right. And in this context, what I mean by just right is that they are such that this energy tensor can be continued into the trajectory of the singularity. This is not gonna be true in all cases, but in certain cases, we may be able to continue the, the energy tensor into the location of singularity, then I could imagine that there is this total energy tensor made up of two parts, a regular part that is, and, and now a singular part that is concentrated on where the particle is, right? So these are of course two big ifs here. Now in addition, suppose for some magic reason, this total energy tensor, this singular thing, is still divergence-free, right? For example, by appealing to principle of conservation of energy is a universal concept. We've got to accept it no matter what. And this equation, this divergence-free equation can be viewed to hold weakly. We understand what does it mean for something to be divergence-free in a weak sense. So we could make sense of that. And if we could make sense of that, then we can get an equation of motion out of this. Because part of this equation is that it says that, you know, the usual thing, derivative of the momentum is the force, right? So you can use that to construct a force that's concentrated on the trajectory of the particle. And it's nothing but, because the total thing is divergence free, the divergence of this part is minus the divergence of the field part. And the divergence of the field part is something we can work with, right? So for example, you can just integrate this on, on a neighborhood of the singularity, use the divergence theorem, and you get an expression for the force. So will this always work? Obviously not. There are, but there are situations where this will work. Just going through the computation, one thing jumps at you that this requires the field momentum density to be integrable in a neighborhood of the singularity. So the field is singular somewhere. And then, but for this project pro procedure to work, 
you need this this object pi sub i, this is the field momentum density, this needs to be locally integrable. Okay, this is a serious restriction. For example, for a standard electromagnetics, Maxwell's electromagnetics, this doesn't work. You can define a momentum for the electromagnetic field, a momentum density for the electromagnetic field. You can compute it in the situation of that you have a point charge, and you can clearly see that this is badly not integrable. So this procedure will not work all the time, and it looks like it doesn't work in the cases that you actually need it. But there's always a way to escape and do something else. So I will get to that. But um, all right, so, um, but suppose this works. Okay, so what did I do? I assumed that this conservation of energy is somehow satisfied, but that also you were gonna question that and say, where does that come from, right? So now I have to say, how do I know that this generalized energy tensor is divergence free? And that's where Einstein's equation is coming. So, because suppose the space-time is a solution of Einstein's equations, then this object, the thing on the right-hand side of the Einstein's equations, is supposed to be the total energy tensor of uh, everything that lives in your space-time. So, this is the Einstein tensor, and on the, on the right, you have this thing that you want to claim it's divergence free. Well, guess what you have on the left of the, the uh, Einstein's equations? You have something that you know it's divergence free. That's the twice contracted second Bianchi identity. Of course, the catch is that the twice contracted second Bianchi identity, in order to even write it down, you need your metric to have three derivatives. If you have a singularity, now that does not make sense anymore. However, if you could make sense of this thing to hold weakly, then this will imply that the energy tensor is divergence free. And we may have a chance of showing that this, this relation is hold weakly. Holds weakly. After all, that's an identity. It does not have to be a solution of anything. Supposed to be for any true for any metric. So, okay, so here we ask the question, and I pose this question to all of you geometers who probably understand these things much better than I do. What are the conditions on a space time metric that guarantee weak form of sec twice contracted second Bianchi identity? to hold in a neighborhood of a space-time singularity. Away from the singularity is not a problem, <laughs> but now we want, to, we want this to be to hold in, in something that contains the singularity, right? In a weak sense. And what does it mean in a weak sense? Well, that we understand. So first of all, we have a partial answer, a preliminary answer. If your manifold is a static and a spherically symmetric, with a central time-like singularity, then this is what we showed, that this, this uh, twice contracted second Bianchi identity holds in the weak sense if the mass function, which you can define in the spherically symmetric setting, has a Taylor expansion of the following form with the first coefficient, the, 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 the constant term being negative. Okay, so, so what am I telling you? I'm telling you that not only matter is a singularity of a space-time, but that singularity is a naked singularity because it's a time-like one, right? It would have to be. If, if particles are supposed to be singularities of a space-time, that that can't be a, a space-like singularity. That has to be a time-like singularity has to be a naked singularity, right? And this is a naked singularity, which somehow also has a negative mass. So, 
Is this too fanciful? Is that not going to work? Negative mass we heard is bad, right? Everybody, the, when they hear negative mass, they want to run away. But, <laughs> but stay with me, and I will convince you that this is actually the, what we want. <laughs> That's, uh, so, OK, so here's co the, the concept of zero area singularities. This is something that was developed by Bray in a series of papers. And uh, these are basically a space times where the model for the space time is negative mass Schwarzschild. So everybody is familiar with Schwarzschild metric. This has been written down on, uh, you have seen it on teens time here, but normally the parameter M that shows up in the Schwarzschild metric is thought of as a positive number. In fact, this thing is always a solution of Einstein's equations. No matter where M is positive, negative, imaginary, doesn't matter, right? There's always a solution. Uh, but uh, so uh, if you take that parameter to be negative, then what you get is the negative mass uh, Schwarzschild. It's a space time that is now uh, has a negative ADM mass, right? So, and, and it has a time-like singularity. It has a naked singularity at the center. And Bray uh, started looking at these space time. So let me, let's first think about this, think back to the spherical symmetric setting. Uh, and uh, because this model of space time is a spherical symmetric, so it makes sense to go back to that. Think about the uh, mass function, which is something that you always have in the spherical symmetric setting. And this mass function has certain properties. Its, its value at infinity is the ADM mass of the space time. You can, because now the, the coordinate r, which is the area radius coordinate, is the same r that you're familiar with with Schwarzschild, except that in the negative mass setting, or in the case of time-like singularity setting, r can go all the way down to zero because there's no horizon, right? So you can go all the way down to zero. And if this mass function has a limit, this limit by definition is called the bare mass of, of the singularity, okay? For negative mass Schwarzschild, these two things are the same because it's a constant. Right? It's the same thing at infinity as at zero. But more generally, it doesn't have to be the same. This will be a function uh, of r. If this number m0 is positive, right, then you can easily put it in, study the metric, and you see that there will be a horizon. So, so that's yes. Not this part. No, this is only for a spherical symmetry. The, the, the mass function and so on. The bare mass also. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you will see, all right, hold on to that question because obviously you need to be able to generalize this, right? So something has to take the place of this. But this is where we are starting for now, so just to understand what's going on. So we don't want a horizon, so we want this number to be negative or zero. And here are some examples, as I said, a negative mass Schwarzschild. You can also look at Reissner weil Nordstrom. This is the solution, the static spherical symmetric solution to Einstein's uh, Maxwell equations. So the charged uh, space time. And so it's got two parameters, M and Q. And when you when you find out what the mass function is, is this expression which as you can see goes to minus infinity if you push r down to zero. So the bare mass of this space time is negative infinity. And uh, here's the prototype of a space time that actually appears in our work. So I still have to tell you, remember, how to cure this problem with Maxwell's equations, right? It turns out it's possible to cure them, that, that issue. And when you do that, you do find a space time that replace this Reissner Nordstrom space time, which have the property that their bare mass is actually finite. So 
the finite negative number. So it's not minus infinity anymore. And this is important because the theorem, if you remember, I will state it again, but this, this kind of space times we show satisfy what we want. They satisfy the, so the weak second Bianchi identity is true for these space times, while we can show it's not true for Rice and Nordstrom. So, so that's, that's the, uh, the difference. Okay, so quick uh, review of uh, second Bianchi identity. You know this part, how you get the identities and you contract them to get at, arrived at this one. This last one is the one that we are interested in generalizing. And simply, simplest way to do that is to just multiply by the gradient of some vector field and integrate by parts and say that that's zero for all vector fields all smooth vector fields compactly supported on the manifold, but of course it needs to contain the boundary of the manifold where the singularity is, right? Otherwise there is no issue. So you can, you can make sense of this. And uh, this is what we would like to show is true or ask the question, when is such a thing true? And uh, the connection with zero area singularities is as follows. Uh, if you have any uh, spherically symmetric uh, static space time, you can always write it in, the, in coordinates, uh, the usual uh, spherically symmetric coordinates. The metric takes this form with the two coefficients that are unknown, alpha and beta. And uh, you can introduce these coordinates, so-called uh, spatially conformally flat coordinates. Uh, I learned th this from Bray, but uh, I, I suppose this was, has been around for a long time. And uh, so you can rewrite your metric in this form, which turns out to be very useful for what we want, because the issue is that we have this space time that's singular on a line, on a time-like line. And somehow this, this has the co-dimension of the singularity is too large. And the way that geometers often resolve that, I learned, is that they blow up the singularity to get something that's easier to handle. So these coordinates do that. They blow up that singularity. So, so if you work it out, you will see that this is in these coordinates, the previous manifold that was only singular on a line, now it's going to be singular on a, on a tube. So basically it's outside of a tube, of a time-like tube. And now you can see why Anagret was interested in tubes. Right? <laughs> this, is, because this is very natural for, this, uh, for these space times. So all of this, Bray did all of this already. You know that in order to talk about uh, is, uh, is zero area singularities. So there isn't the word the zero area singularity is clear because because uh, the topology of these manifolds is the exterior of a ball times R, and then when you um, when you look at the uh, boundary of that that the sphere, right? And in a slice, you're just going to have a sphere as the boundary. And the area of that sphere in this metric is zero. So that's why it's called zero area singularities. Yeah, so this is what explains here. And uh, the constant T slices are a space like hypersurfaces, diffeomorphic to the exterior of a ball now. Right? So uh, if I want to draw a picture, you have. Uh, I mean, you're familiar with this from, uh, this picture has been drawn many times in this conference, right? This is the, the black hole case. So the naked case looks like this, right? And what, what these coordinates do is that they blow this up. So it's gonna look like this again. 
as basically what the upshot is. So uh, in his work, Bray defined a notion of mass for these singularities. So he showed that you can attach the concept of mass to that sphere uh, of zero area that, that, that you have there. And he showed that this mass is always negative. So when I saw that, I jumped up and, <laughs> and said, okay, this is what we need because this is, uh, it's actually uh, uh, the, the bare mass, we were looking for negative bare mass and these zero area singularities have negative mass, okay? Now, here's the construction. So first of all, of course, Bray's work is general. There's no need for a spherical symmetry or any kind of symmetry. And so he, has, he, he did this in the most general way but we can take it and apply it to our specific situation. So if you have a particular kind of these, which are called regular, are very nicely described in the following way. So this is the condition. It is, you have, it's called a zero, because a regular, such a, a, such a ZAS is regular. If it satisfies these conditions, basically if you can be conformally extended. So you have the normal derivative of this function. You have a function that's zero, on that surface and its normal derivative is positive. And then you can write the metric as uh, phi to the four times a, a regular metric, a smooth metric. So all the singularity is captured in this function phi. And uh, so, uh, and then this is the definition of the mass. Okay. Well, this is obviously negative because it has a minus sign in the front, but uh, so this in itself is not so interesting, right? Because you, maybe you didn't have to put that minus sign there, then it would be positive. So, okay, so this is the definition and then it looks weird, at least to, to, to someone like me who is not familiar with these things. And, uh, but here's the main thing. He showed, Bray showed that this is the limit of the Hawking mass of the spheres that are shrinking down. So take any sequence of uh, diffeom uh, uh, surfaces, diffeomorphic to a stew, that are surrounding your singularity and are shrinking down to it, then the limit of the Hawking mass of these spheres is this uh, gray mass, is this, uh, this negative thing. So we all know that Hawking mass can be positive or negative. So in this case, these will be negative and they will converge to this uh, expression that Bray had. So um, if you are in this spherically symmetric setting, that mass function is, is automatically the Hawking mass of the, of the sphere of radius r. So if you put these together and you see that what I wanted to think of as the bare mass of the singularity is actually this gray notion of mass for the zero area. Okay, so to answer your question now, so now I have something that at least works without the spherical symmetry. Right, uh, so that's, um, okay, so here are our theorems. Uh, Basically, once you, uh, once you know what, what you need, right? <laughs> Say, okay, I want certain identity to, to hold true in the weak sense, right? I take this, these coordinates, I compute everything in these coordinates and see what kind of fall off I need for, uh, for the identity to hold. So you'll figure this out. You'll see that you need this coefficient phi and gamma to satisfy certain fall off conditions, and you also need the Einstein tensor to fall off or blow up at some controlled rate. And so long as it doesn't blow up worse than uh, minus five uh, in, the, in the coordinate that measuring the, the distance uh, or the radius, then you're good and then it can show that this uh, uh, Bianchi identity is satisfied in a weak sense. So that in itself, I wouldn't say it's very interesting, 
but because it's phrased in terms of something uh, in, in a particular coordinate system and so on, this is not what a, a, a real geometer will not will be turned off by such a thing. They would they would just start looking for some invariant way of characterizing this. So so then we said, okay, what happens in the case of a uh, when you have this mass function, can you put this in terms of the mass function? And it turns out that, yeah, you can put this in terms of the mass function. So whenever you have the mass function, you can, uh, uh, and if it does have a Taylor expansion, right? Now, all you need that it has actually a Taylor expansion like that, and, and that the first term is, either the first term is negative, or if that's zero, then the next one has, should be not too large. That's, um, so this is it, this, this gives at least a criterion in the case of this particular, although it's a limited kind of a space time, but as I was saying before, it was important for the physical application to be able to do this for these kind of a space times. And you will see why when I get to the applications. So the proof is very simple. So it's, Uh, uh, because you want, uh, you want, uh, it's, it's important not to have a horizon. So that's, uh, otherwise these coordinates that I was talking about will break down and, right? So yeah, it doesn't enter in a direct way. It's more like, and it's also only interesting because of the applications to, to have the, to, to look at the negative case, right? What are the applications? So uh, just reminder, the uh, reisner weil nostrom is a, is a space time for which this, this property is not satisfied. Why, why is that a problem? Well, if this turns out, it's related to that problem that I mentioned about Maxwell's equations. So many slides ago, I was telling you that Maxwell's equations, ordinary Maxwell's equations have this problem that the, the, a point charge creates a field around itself, and this field, it's singular where the point charge is. So you cannot use that same field to get an equation of motion for the singularity, right? This is the so-called, the problem of self force in electrodynamics of point particles. This is a very, very classical problem, well-known problem. This problem becomes a hundred times worse when you couple Maxwell's equations to gravity. Because if you think about it, Einstein says, G mu nu equals T mu nu. So if T mu nu is singular, this means that the geometry of a spacetime is singular. When the T mu nu is very badly singular, like it is in the case of Maxwell's uh, energy tensor for point particles, this is gonna make the space-time geometry very bad. So the example of that is this Reissner-Nordstrom. Remember, this is the naked Reissner-Nordstrom, right? This is, why is it, why am I, why the naked Reissner-Nordstrom? So you can see, because we're talking about particles, right? All particles that I know that have mass and charge, right? We're talking elementary particles, right? Say, for example, electrons. Right, this, uh, this is supposed to be here. Suppose you want to model the electron in this way by reissner nordstrom you would have to put the mass of the electron here and the charge of the electron here, right? And we all know that if the mass to charge ratio is small, you have a black hole. And if it's large, uh, sorry, if the mass to charge is large, or the charge to mass is small, then you have a black hole. If the charge to mass is large, is too much charge, supercharged, then it is naked. For the electron, this ratio is 10 to the 21. So it's bigger than one, right? So that's, uh, so, so that's naked. That's, uh, <laughs> I agree with that, right? No, no arguments there. So, but there's an alternative because it turns out that when Maxwell wrote down the Maxwell's equations, 
he made an assumption because Maxwell's equations are stated for four fields, four vector fields, right? You've seen them, E, B, D, H, right? Maxwell's equations are written in terms of these four fields, but then you're not, not, there are not enough equations to really tell us what all of these fields do. You need to close this system by assuming what two of them, how two of them depend on the other two. This is called the constitutive relation. So Maxwell chose the is simplest thing he could think of, which is E equals D and B equals H, and that gives you the standard electromagnetics, which is the bad one. Right? However, that's not the only thing you can do. And I think, is, is Jerome here still? Or? In Jerome's talk, you may have seen how you can start with the Lagrangian and modify it to take quantities that would normally go to infinity, not go to infinity, and be limited, right? You can play that game with electromagnetics. And when you do that, you get nonlinear versions of the electromagnetic theory. So there's a price to pay. The equations are not nonlinear. But this problem with the infinities and so on, you can cure. Now everything is finite. And you can then couple that to gravity. This was done already in the 30s. So this is this Hoffman space time. And when you write down the mass function of the Hoffman space time, it does not have that problem anymore. It is, doesn't have that kind of bad singularity. So in fact, it has a Taylor expansion and uh, of the kind that we need. And this can also be generalized. That's not the only example. There's basically one free function here, this is zeta. It's called the reduced Hamiltonian. And if this reduced Hamiltonian, so long as it grows like the square root of its arguments, we are good. So there are many nonlinear theories that would fit into the category that we want. So these will be all theories in which uh, can be coupled to gravity and get solutions for which you can carry out the, 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 uh, the program that we wanted. So here's the summary of what I was saying before, right? Uh, this is what I was saying. So uh, instead of Born's idea, this was Born's idea. And instead of E equals D, just put it E equals D over square root of one plus D squared. And that's, uh, you know, so that's, and that cures the problem. And uh, so, of course, uh, you pay a price for it that this, now the equations are nonlinear. So now if you had a solution for one point charge, you want the solution for two point charges, you have to go back to the beginning and redo this. And the solution for two point charge is not known, unfortunately. There are other ways of curing it, and that's, um, uh, for example, one can have higher order vacuum laws where the fields, the, the B, say the, the D depends on the derivatives of E as well. So there's this Klein-Gordon relationship, for example. This is called Bob Lande thomas podolsky uh, electromagnetism. So this is linear, but higher order. So, in, in the, so now you can add things and so on. And we have a theorem on this one where we can complete this, this cycle and we can get the force and get the Cauchy problem for the joint evolutions of fields and particles to have a unique global solution. This is all thanks to the, what, what I described before. And recently, uh, our student, Eric Amorim, found a static and spherically symmetric electrovacuum solution to Einstein Maxwell with this, this law of uh, electrovacuum law. So, uh, so at least there is, one can see that one could conceivably make progress in the joint gravity electromagnetism problem in this way. Okay, future plans, you would like to extend. So the, in fact, what I told you wasn't quite true. Not all the spherical symmetric solutions work. We had some relationship between these coefficients uh, that one has to be the inverse of the other for the kind of space times we have been interested in. This was true, but if it's not true in general, we would still think our theorem should work, but you haven't figured, uh, done that yet. One should be able to get rid of symmetry completely, but uh, uh, 
but maybe one can do that in stages by first looking at less symmetric things. And uh, another interesting thing, which I don't have time to talk about, is to look at spaces with non-trivial topology. This is connected to the quantum aspects of the problem that would be a subject of a different talk. And of course, one needs to do it for arbitrary number of point charges and so on. And this is what we are currently exploring. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, let's maybe start with Zoom audience, if they have any questions. Christina, you have a question? I guess I can ask something. Um, yeah. 